Yeah. 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 and promote peace and harmony between the two faith groups. In today's proceeding, we'll get to know each other better and share our perspectives, enhance knowledge, build bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood. This will be a great opportunity for every one of us to reach out to each other, seek knowledge and share ideas. All our respected guests, brothers, sisters, Seekers of knowledge and truth will have a lot more information and detail understanding by the end of today's program. A brief introduction of our speakers today. <coughs> Imam Mukhtar Chima Sahib is currently serving as Vice Principal and Lecturer of Comparative Religious Studies at the Ahmadiyya Institute of Islamic Studies. After graduating from Punjab University, he devoted his life for the service of faith in 1971. He completed his six-year missionary degree from the Ahmadiyya Institute of Islamic Studies in Pakistan. He served as a missionary in several parts of Pakistan. He was, in, he was appointed as a missionary in Ghana, Africa for several years. Imam Chima has <coughs> served as regional missionary in New York, St. Louis, Missouri, and Washington, D.C. in the U.S before being transferred to Canada as a professor in 2003. Second production is of Dr. George Johnson, Johnson, Pastor Hilltop Bible Chapel. George Johnson is a pastor or an elder in Hilltop Bible Chapel, Etobicoke. By profession, he is a teacher in Peelboard and Brampton. Before migrating to Canada in 2000, he had been working in India as a research fellow and a lecturer in biology in different colleges and high schools. He has spoken at various Christian conferences, conducts seminars on creation evolution issues, and writes articles on Christian apologetics in various magazines. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Today's um, topic, as we all know, is a very key topic, a very profound topic on the death and life of Jesus. Did Jesus die on a cross? So this is the topic we are gathered here today. So we will have uh, two, spe uh, two speakers, presenters. First one is uh, Pastor George Johnson from uh, Hilltop Bible. Uh, he will speak, uh, present point of view on the topic, Christian perspective. And then we will have a uh, second speaker, presenter, <coughs> Imam Tajima, who is going to be presenting uh, MDM Muslim community's uh, point of view, perspective. So first I will invite um, Pastor George Johnson to the stage, please. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Greetings to you all. I give a special gratitude to my Muslim brothers who have organized this uh, meeting. Uh, it has taken a lot of planning, a lot of work behind the scenes to organize such a friendly uh, dialogue today, and I really want to thank uh, them all, those who work behind this scene, to make this possible. And I want to thank uh, our distinguished speaker today, uh, Mukhtar Chima, Imam Mukhtar Chima, uh, who is a <coughs> vice principal and a professor. He's a busy person, but still he has graciously approved uh, or agreed to be here today to take part in this dialogue. So I express my gratitude to him too. First of all, I would like to describe why I have agreed to this uh, dialogue. Why am I here and why am I doing this? Um, is it because I dislike Muslims or I want to argue with, with them? God forbid it. The, the truth is just the opposite. I want to read a verse from the Bible why I'm doing this dialogue today. This says, 
but in your heart revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the, give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. <clears throat> when Brother Munawar suggested this uh, topic, did Jesus die on the cross? I knew that they have uh, several questions about the topic. And the Bible asks, Bible tells me, be ready to give an answer to those who, you, who ask you questions about any topic. So I took this as a, as a responsibility uh, to give a few reasons here uh, to tell you why I believe in the death of, Lord, the death of Jesus Christ. But there is a condition that the Bible puts on every Christian. And that condition is given here, and that is with gentleness and respect. I, will, I won't be able to go beyond that or ignore that condition. I have to be respectful all the time, and I have to be gentle all the time in conveying the truth, because that is what the Bible asks me to do, and I will try to stick to that. Uh, let me give you uh, two important facts at the beginning, before I start the, uh, start, before I come to my proofs. The first thing, I would not be speaking anything ill against the Quran. There is one reason why I wouldn't do that. There is a big reason why I respect this book, because this book points to the previous <coughs> book of God. For that reason, I respect this book, because this tells me, this points me to the previous book of God, which is the Bible. For that reason, I wouldn't be saying anything ill or bad about this book. I wouldn't be criticizing this book, because I respect this book. From a personal study, I have come to, I have understood one truth that the Quran never criticizes the book. It only criticizes the people of the book. Now you might be asking, what is the difference? This is the difference. In the seventh century, when the Quran was composed, most of the people were illiterate. The Christians and the Jews, though they had the Bible, but most of them were illiterate and they couldn't read, they couldn't understand the truth from the Bible. So people started developing their own oral traditions and distorted beliefs and all that. So it was very necessary that Quran would condemn those oral beliefs. And Quran has done that, rightly done that. But you will see in the Quran that the Quran has never criticized the book. Never. The Quran says the Torah and the Gospel which was given before Quran, before the Quran, is God's word. I will come to that point uh, more, uh, elaborate that more later, but uh, at the beginning let me tell you this is what I believe about the Quran. The Quran points to the Bible, Quran criticizes the people of the book, but not the book. For that reason, I respect this Quran. The second thing, my personal policy, I would not be using any uh, title before Jesus or Muhammad. Usually Christians say Lord Jesus, and Muslims say Prophet Muhammad. But let's be honest here, Christians don't have the practice of saying Prophet Muhammad, and Muslims don't have the practice of saying Lord Jesus. So just to be fair with both groups, I'm not going to use those titles. I'm just going to say Jesus and Muhammad. But by no means I'm, I'm trying to be disrespectful. I, I keep Muhammad and Jesus in a very high regard, I give them utmost respect, but just to be fair, I would be simply uh, addressing them as Jesus and Muhammad. So first of all, I want to apologize to both communities. Please forgive me for uh, doing this. <clears throat> so let's uh, come to the topic now. The topic is, uh, as you saw before, um, the did Jesus die on the on the cross? Now. Uh, determining the source of information, if, if the source of information is trustworthy. The book that talks about the death of Jesus is the Bible. But is the Bible trustworthy? Can you fully believe the Bible? That is the question. If you check the Bible, uh, you uh, let me give you a little information about the Bible. The Bible is not just one book. It is a book 
It is a collection of 66 books. 39 of those books were written before, Lo before Jesus came to the world, and we place those books in the Old Testament section. 27 of those books were written after Jesus came to the world, and we place those books in the New Testament section. So we have 66 books uh, in the Bible. If you examine the Bible in the Old Testament, the word like God said or thus says the Lord has been used more than 3,800 times. 3,800 times it says God said or thus says the Lord. The meaning is the people who wrote the Old Testament, the authors who wrote the, wrote the Old Testament knew that they have got the revelation from God and they were writing the words of God. When you come to the New Testament, there too you will see authors like John, Peter, Paul, they have repeatedly said this, that they are receiving the word, the revelation of God and they are writing the words of God. So the Bible claims that this is the word of God. Now, you might say a claim in itself is not enough. You need evidence, right? There are so many external and internal evidences to prove that the Bible is the word of God, but I have no time to go over all of them. I will be just going to only one evidence, which is from the Quran. As I told you at the beginning, why I respect Quran? Because the Quran points to the Bible. In the days of Quran, the Jewish people were reading the Torah or the Old Testament and the, uh, the Christians were reading Gospels or the New Testament. In the, in the Quran, the word Torah and Gospel appear so many times. And every time it says that this is God's word. There are, I'm going to point to nine <coughs> proofs from the Quran to prove that the Bible was uncorrupted in the days of Muhammad. Please listen to this. Nine proofs to prove that the Bible was uncorrupted in the days of Muhammad. So let me read those uh, nine proofs. The Quran verified the previous books. Many times Quran says it verifies. It claims to verify or confirm the previous books. Second, Allah asked the Muhammad to verify his revelation with the previous books. Third, Muhammad believed in the previous books. Muhammad believed in Torah and Gospel. <coughs> Number four, Allah asked the Jews and Christians to follow their books. Number five, Allah says that there is guidance and light in the previous books. Number six, Allah guarded the previous books from corruption. Number seven, Allah's people, that is Jews and Christians, guarded the previous books from corruption. Number eight, Allah didn't blame the Torah of any corruption, even in a case of an obvious difference. There was a difference between the Quran and the Torah, but still Allah didn't say that the Torah was corrupted. Rather, Allah asked Muhammad to ask the children of Israel. Number nine, there is no verse in the Quran that names a biblical book, such as the Torah or the Gospel, and says that it was corrupted. Now, these nine proofs tell us that the, the biblical books were not corrupted in the days of Muhammad. If the, those books were corrupted, Allah would not say all these nine statements or uh, uh, Allah would not refer uh, people to go back to the, to the Torah and the Gospel. But how does that help us today? People might say, okay, uh, but the Bible could be corrupted today, right? So this is how you come to the conclusion that the Bible is not corrupted today. The Quran verified the biblical books in the 7th century. So that, that should tell us that earlier to the 7th century, the Bible was not corrupted either, right? Until the 7th century, it is not corrupted. So if we can get some copies from the earlier centuries and base our translations on those copies, we have an uncorrupted word of God. And that is what exactly the Bible translators have done. They have found the oldest available manuscript, which is from the 3rd and 4th century AD. In the 7th century AD, Quran said the Bible is uncorrupted, but Bible translators have found the manuscript from the 3rd and 4th centuries, century AD, 
and they have uh, based their translation on those uh, manuscripts. So when the Bible was not corrupted in the 7th century, that means it was not corrupted in the 3rd and 4th centuries either. So when we base our translations on those manuscripts, we have a pure word of God. That is how Christians come to the conclusion that the Bible is still not corrupted. It is still the uncorrupted word of God. So I just want to give you a, uh, give you a preview of why it is good to take the story from the Bible and still believe that everything is accurate and authentic. Because the Bible is still the word of God, uncorrupted word of God. Now we will move to the next uh, slide. Uh, yeah, there is one um, statement in the in the Quran which I just want to read that every Muslim is asked to believe in the Bible. Did you know that? It might surprise some some of you, right? Uh, I'm not talking about Ahmadiyya Muslims. They are friendly. They read the Bible. They try to understand the Bible. But uh, uh, when we look at the other uh, people all around the world, the Muslim population, many times they are taught that. The Bible is a corrupted book, you should not be believing in it. But what does the Quran say? I'm going to read that. From Quran 4, 136, it says, O you, o you who believe, that is Muslims, believe in Allah and his messenger and the book which he has revealed to his messenger, that is the Quran, and the book which he revealed before, that is the Bible. Right? No doubt. Everybody is asked to believe in the Quran and believe in the Bible. And then it says, and whoever disbelieves in Allah and his angels and his books, in plural, in his books and his messengers and the last day, he indeed strays far away. So there is a warning here. If someone says the Bible is corrupted, they don't want to believe in the Bible, the Quran says that person is straying far away. So I want to gently and friendly request everyone Christians and Muslims alike to take the Bible seriously because the Quran says it is the word of God and Quran asks you to uh, go back to the book. Now, we'll come to the, our main topic, main point, um, which is uh, the Quran's view on the death of Jesus Christ. There are two views in the Quran. The first view is that Jesus was not crucified. Okay? That is the traditional uh, view of Muslims all over the world, the majority view of Muslims. And that comes from Quran 4, 157, where it says that they said, they means the Jews, they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts. Uh, with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow, for, for a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself, and Allah is exalted in power wise. That is from the translation of Yusuf Ali, uh, the most trusted translation among the Muslim world. But the second view is that Jesus died. Jesus died. That most Muslims don't know about this belief because it contradicts the first view. Right? But still there are verses in the Quran that says that Jesus died. Quran 355. When Allah said, O oh Jesus, I will cause thee to die and exalt thee. Quran 5117. Jesus said, When thou didst cause me to die, these verses in the Quran says that Jesus did die. So there is a conflicting, uh, there are two different conflicting views in the Quran. Now the question is this, when the Quran says Jesus did die, was that a natural death or a crucifixion death? And what happened to Jesus after his death? Is he still in a grave or was he taken up to heaven? So we need to discuss these uh, issues. So let's talk about, uh, uh, talk about uh, the proofs now. Uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, 21, pro pro 21 proofs supporting the crucifixion death of Jesus. Uh, from the Bible, the Quran, history, and logic. First proof. Proof number one. The Quran is not an authentic and complete book on the life of Jesus. And when I say that, I, I'm talking about... Uh, 
intellectually, uh, historically. The authentic life of Jesus is given in the Bible in four Gospels. It is not in the Quran. In the Quran, there are more than 90 references to Jesus, but they are scattered. They are not in order. From that, you cannot derive or make a complete life story of Jesus or a biography of Jesus. So that is why I say this is not an authentic and complete book on the life of Jesus. Everybody should agree to that. I'll give you an example. Why do I say that? Um, in the Quran, there is no record of what happened to Jesus in his last days. But when you go to the Bible, there are so much, uh, so much description about the about what happened to Jesus in the last day that we can even reconstruct the whole week to see what happened to Jesus in the last uh, in, in in his last week. Uh, let me read those things. On Sunday, triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. On Monday, Jesus cleanses the temple by expelling the merchants. On Tuesday, Jesus predicts his death after two days. On Wednesday, the Olivet Discourse. That means Jesus talks about his second coming. On Thursday, the Last Supper and the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Friday, early morning, Jesus arrested and goes through various trials. Jesus is crucified at, two, at 9 a.m. and dies at 3 p.m. On Saturday, the body of Jesus in the tomb and the entrance sealed with a Roman seal. Sunday, early morning, Jesus resurrected and after 40 days, he is on the earth, he is taken up into heaven. So this is what you see in the Bible, but in the Quran you wouldn't find any record, any uh, description about the last days of Jesus. In fact, there are only six statements in the Quran that talks about the ministry of Lord Jesus, the, the, public, sorry, the, the public ministry of Jesus. The public ministry of Jesus happened for three and a half years, and the Bible in four Gospels, in detail, describes everything. But in the Quran, there are only six sentences, sorry, six statements. And there are no statements about the final week of Jesus. So what I'm trying to say is, the, the purpose of the Quran was not to give an authentic biography of Jesus. Not at all. Quran has a different purpose. But the purpose of the Bible was to give the authentic biography of Jesus. So those who want to know, those who want to learn for sure what happened to Jesus in the last days of his life, they should return to the Bible. And when you return to the Bible, you will see that he was crucified and he died. So that was my first proof that the, the for the authentic and complete information of the life and death of Jesus, one needs to return to the, to the Bible. We'll go to the second proof, which is, the Quran does speak about the death and the ascension of Jesus. I already read those verses where Quran speaks about the death of Jesus and it speaks about the ascension of Jesus, where it says he was taken up. He was taken up to Allah. Uh, due to the lack of time, I, I, I cannot explain uh, too much that there are different views about this. Uh, but during the question answer session, if people ask those questions, I'll be able to explain. So I'm moving to the third now. The proof number three, the Quran verifies the, the written gospels as true. I just want to read, uh, I just want to explain that a little bit. The written gospels means the four gospels in the Bible. Quran verifies that those four gospels are true. But in the Muslim world, there is a misunderstanding. The Muslims believe that the, the gospel, was give, gospel was a book which was given to Jesus. Jesus was given a book called Gospel, and that book is lost. And now the four gospels that we have in the Bible is not, are not the real gospels. But that, I cannot agree with that interpretation. Let's see why. Uh, look at here what it says. No, the previous, again. We can go back to the previous. Yes. Uh, the, the confusion among Muslims about the gospel. In Quran 546, Allah says, we gave him the gospel. In Quran 1930, Jesus says, he has given me the book. 
From these two verses, our Muslim brothers come to the conclusion that Jesus was given a book called the Gospel. And they believe that uh, Christians were reading, the, the reading that Gospel in the days of Muhammad. Because the Quran says that. In Quran um, 547 and 568, it says that Christians were reading the Gospel. But the problem is this. When you examine the history, in the days of Muhammad, Christians were reading only these four Gospels. There is no proof that ever a book called Gospel was given to Jesus. There is no proof that such a book ever existed and that book is lost. No proof. Any time of history you check, Christians had only these four Gospels. Only the four Gospels. So when the Quran says that Christians were reading Gospel, in the days of Muhammad, that refers to the same gospel that we have in the Bible. So when Quran says that Quran verifies the gospel, that means Quran verifies those same four gospels. So those same four gospels say that Jesus died and <coughs> resurrected. We take that as confirmed by the Quran. That is why uh, proof number three is the Quran verifies the gospel and the gospel tells us that Jesus died on the cross. Next proof. Quran 4.157 is merely a rebuke statement against some arrogant Jews. Why is this not a factual statement? Why is this just a rebuke statement? Because it says, they said in both, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They are bragging that they killed Jesus. But Allah is saying this, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, so it was made to appear to them. It is a rebuke statement, not a factual statement. Just like if you help your son to do finish his school project, and uh, if, his, if your son starts bragging, oh, I did this project uh, by myself, what will, what will uh, the father say? No, you didn't do the project, right? Because the father will be annoyed, and he will say, you didn't do, do the project. The same uh, logic is applied here. They are bragging that they killed Jesus. Allah is saying, you did not kill him. Why? Because he came back to life. So this is just a rebuke statement. Let's go to the next uh, proof. Proof number five. Quran 4.157 is ambiguous and is subject to various interpretations among Muslims. Now, if this statement <coughs> simply said that the Jews didn't kill him, nor crucified him, then it would have been a plain statement. But when it says that so it was made to appear to them, it becomes confusing. What does that mean? Does that mean that uh, Jesus was not on the cross? It only appeared that he was on the cross? There are two interpretations of this verse among the Muslims. The first interpretation is majority interpretation that someone else was made to look like Jesus and he was put on the cross and Jesus was standing somewhere else and later he was taken into uh, heaven unharmed. That is one uh, interpretation. The second interpretation is what our Ahmadiyya Muslim brothers believe, that Jesus was put on the cross, but he didn't die on the cross. It was, it was, it was made to appear to them that he died. So what I'm trying to say is this verse is ambiguous. This is unclear. Among Muslims themselves, there are various interpretations. It's confusing. We don't know uh, which interpretation sh we should go with. So I'm going to present an alternative interpretation. An interpretation which can be justified by history. The, al the alternative interpretation is this. When, Cor when the Quran says that they didn't kill, uh, the Quran says that they, they killed him not, nor crucified him, the Quran is speaking the truth that he was not killed, that he came back to life. But when then it says, so it was made to appear to them. What does that mean? If that means the Jews thought that they were in control. They thought that they were in control. They arrested Jesus and they killed him. But the Quran says, no, it was made to appear to them that they were in control. Exact, uh, in, in fact, in reality, it was God who was in control. So everything was made to appear to them as if they were doing this. But it was God who was in control, and when it appeared to them that he was killed, put in the tomb, God brought him back again to life. 
So that is the Christian interpretation of these words, or the or an interpretation which is more true to the to the history. It fits with the historical fact. So this uh, verse is ambiguous. So that is why I have taken proof number five that this verse is ambiguous from the Quran. Uh, Muslims themselves cannot um, agree on a proper interpretation. That is why Christians have come up with an alternative interpretation that it was made to appear to them that they are in control, but actually it was God who was in control, and God was the one who was letting everything happen. Let's go to the next uh, proof, proof number six. The number of verses giving the testimony. Uh, now, for argument's sake, if we accept that the Quran denies, or Muhammad denied the death of Jesus, then uh, compare the, the number of verses from the Quran and from the Bible. In the Quran, there is only one verse. So the truth has to be found between one verse and over 200 verses from the Bible. Isolated verses. 200 isolated verses, excluding the, the death and resurrection chapters, nine death and resurrection, resurrection chapters, uh, from the from the Bible. Okay. Um, now, proof number uh, seven. Uh, the number of people giving the testimony. For argument's sake, if we believe that uh, the Quran denies or Muhammad denied the crucifixion, then the testimony has to be decided. The truth has to be decided between 